Uh, welcome virtually to the Australian National University's College of Law. I'm Dr. Pip Ryan. I'm an Associate Professor in the ANU College of Law. And um, I'm also a barrister and I've written a whole lot of stuff on blockchain standards, which is, has been an amazing piece of work. Um, my main area of interest has always been fraud and the liability of third parties. I don't think we've got much of that here today, but we'll see if we can squeeze something in. Um, I just want to start by acknowledging the land that we're all on. We're all on lands in various parts of the world. Looking at the attendee list, we've got people in the States, Hong Kong, London, Europe, and here in Australia. And I want to acknowledge that the Australian National University sits on land that was occupied for tens of thousands of years prior to the arrival of Europeans. Um, it makes us one of the oldest inhabited parts of the world, of this precious world, which we're gonna talk a lot about tonight. I pay respects to and honour all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people, as well as their elders past, present and emerging. And I also acknowledge the song lines, song spirals, traditions and living cultures of First Nations people from all over the world, including wherever you are this evening. Um, so it's my very great privilege and honour to welcome Liz Gillies to this. Liz is the CEO of the Menzies Foundation, which has very kindly backed and informed and participated in the development of this three-part series for 2021. We've been incredibly lucky with the lineup of people who've been able to join us. And we also have Dr. Damien Clifford, who's a colleague of mine in the College of Law, and we've got Bruce Cahan, who is burning the midnight oil over in California. Um, we are your three speakers. I know Cassandra um, Steer was also scheduled, but unfortunately, Cassandra's not well. So I'm going to fill Cassandra's shoes. I will be the thorn between, oh, sorry. Yeah, the thorn between two roses. Why not? I can be the thorn between the two roses of Damien and, and Bruce. I'll go in the middle. But before we commence with Bruce, I want to allow and invite Liz to say a couple of words about the Menzies Foundation and its role in this. And it is my great um, honour and privilege to welcome her from Melbourne, which has been in lockdown for a lot longer than we have and has borne it very well. And we're looking forward to heading down there shortly for one of those amazing coffees. Well, Liz. thank you. Thank you, Pip. Can I just say that um, things like tonight certainly are highlights in lockdown because Melbourne is now, for those who are joining us from all parts of the world, the city that's been in, the, in uh, lockdown for the longest of any city in the world. So I'm um, not only grateful for the distraction of tonight, but very um, grateful to Pip for all her work in putting this series together and for the outstanding speakers that she's curated. The Menzies Foundation uh, was established to honour the legacy of Australia's longest serving Prime Minister, Sir Robert Menzies, and we aspire to raise the profile and importance of outstanding leadership. Sununian Stephen is a very special Australian who made an extraordinary contribution to Australia and to the law, both in Australia and globally. And this series, uh, the Menzies Foundation's relationship with ANU's College of Law is to honour his legacy uh, in terms of that contribution. And also uh, he was um, a very important uh, person in the history of the foundation. So I really um, have no doubt that Suninian would be very proud of the topic tonight. Um, space and uh, the many questions that surround it, I think, are one of the really significant challenges for the law as we move forward into those new frontiers. And Pip, once again, thank you for your hard work, but also thank you for curating such an outstanding group of speakers tonight for us to consider something that's only on a, a short-term horizon, really, in terms of how quickly the world's moving as space becomes a reality and not just a dream. So over to you, Pip. Thanks very much. Thanks, Liz. Um, okay, so the format for this evening is as follows. We're going to have three seminar presentations, first by Bruce, then me, and then Damien. If you want to ask any questions of the panellists, please feel free to use the Q&A function in chat. However, it is not a live chat, and there will be no responses to those questions this evening. The deal is that all attendees and everybody else who registered, even if they couldn't attend this evening, 
will receive an invitation next week's Q&A. So we will have a one hour Q&A in relation to this evening. And your questions to Damien and Bruce will be answered directly by them during the week. And then I will attend and host the Q&A. That's known as the Menzies Cybermasters. And that'll be the final event in the series of three for 2021. So um, really looking forward to the Q&A next week. You, as well as getting the opportunity to ask any further questions via email, you'll be invited to do that. We will also be sharing with you some very cool documents um, and resources from Damien, Bruce and myself. Just four things to read. Okay, so without further ado, Bruce Cahan, your bio sat on the promotional materials. So I will just say this before we hand over to you, that Bruce and I presented this time last year to a conference on behalf of Stanford's Codex. And that's really where Bruce and I have got to know each other. We presented on the topic of trust in space. Um, the, the really, really cool thing about the Stanford project we've worked on is that we did develop a brilliant peer-reviewed journal for blockchain policy. And that's been where we have sat. Bruce is on midnight time. He's burning the midnight oil over in California. I'll switch to you and hand over to you. Thank you, Pip. Um, and I, uh, I couldn't be more pleased to be uh, a night owl with you all uh, at this moment. Um, um, as you can see, uh, reprising a talk that I gave at the request of our Space Force, uh, Air Force Research Lab, Defense Innovation Unit, etc., um, at an annual conference uh, uh, called the State of the Industrial Base, uh, where we look at the issues relating to space that are of a national security uh, imperative. And so um, with, with your indulgence, I'll, I'll use some of these slides to take us through uh, issues that, that will be and are um, illegally pressing. So to get right into it, um, as I see it, space is and is becoming a battlefield for two primary economic systems that uh, we must uh, win, I think. Um, and these systems operate by very different legal structures. Uh, the centrally planned space economy operates uh, with uh, a very familiar uh, set of actors and uh, peer space competitors and a market-based, and I, and I don't make any um, claim that the U.S. is a pure market-based economy. It is not. It's hybrid, as, as are most uh, uh, European and Australian uh, uh, approaches to the economy. The government's very involved. But it is market-driven. Um, uh, there isn't the top-down top control. And uh, the problem we have in, in America um, is that we have these two to four year election cycles, you may have noticed, and, and those from time to time create some unpredictability in where will policy and therefore where will law take us. And last time I checked, uh, space doesn't come and go every two to four years. It's actually there for, for a long time. Um, space is attracting a lot of venture capital uh, increasingly, and um, that's good news. Uh, but the the cautionary tale there is that most VC backed companies don't uh, ultimately survive. Some are, are acquired, uh, but most do not survive. And so, if you're depending on VC uh, money to get you the infrastructure utility of space, uh, such as launch and bandwidth and debris removal and other things, um, maybe maybe we have some, some other ways that we've developed in our terrestrial economies that we should look at to, to bring into, into space. Um, obviously, CubeSats have, have changed the dynamics for how you operate in space, how quickly you can get to space, and uh, version 
what is up there, much like the, the iPhone and the other uh, wearables that, that we deal with. Um, so imagine that we would want to have, and we should have, a Rubik's Cube for financing space. Um, and, you know, here I, I would ask, even though I you know, am in the States, um, let's, let's think about the Truman Show and the, the artificiality, let us call it, of uh, how finance is conducted in national security industries like space, um, where, you know, it's a game. It's, it's not conducted for its long-term benefit. It's conducted for the long-term benefit of the few prime contractors. Um, and we need to break free of that certainly here um, and, and I think if we if we break free of that myopia we, we actually look at what are the types of uh, economic structures market structures that we would want to use to build the critical infrastructure that we call space such that we can have a 2060 North Star vision of the critical infrastructure uh, functionality of space. Um, if, if space is critical infrastructure, which many of us believe it's become and will increasingly serve, whether it's to provide imagery or provide um, a launching pad to, to go to, to places where you can uh, get natural resources without the constraints of uh, violating indigenous rights and environmental issues, then, then we need to be innovative. And, and I've called for us to have a, a, a dose of financial engineering alongside the aerospace engineering. Uh, and, and I don't see enough of that uh, globally. And, and so, you know, I, I think that will become a necessary ingredient for the market-based economies to actually succeed in, in space. I love this slide because on the right, this is a, a slide from uh, a report called the Shadow Banking Report from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York after the 2008 financial crisis. And basically, it's, it, it simplifies the entire function of the financial system to four things, transforming risk, return, asset type, and maturity. How long does capital stay in the form that it is uh, set in. And, and we need that engine. If, if, if the right-hand side of, side of the slide looks like a circuit board, or it's intended to. Um, we need that transformation of risk uh, to be very, very uh, predictable for space investments to scale. Um, we, we've heard about, or some of us have heard about SPACs, uh, uh, Special Purpose Acquisition Corporations, which have become very popular for uh, space companies to, to go, in effect, public uh, pre-IPO uh, by being acquired by these shelf companies. Some of us who are old enough to have lived through and as lawyers um, uh, having to handle the, the remains of junk bonds may have our, our cautions around SPACs because pa what SPACs are really doing is they're compensating for the difficulty of in the short term valuing a, a space company based on the services uh, that it, it, it provides and not certain as to the demand curve for those services. Who's the customer to buy that much launch or that much imagery? So, um, a, a, a company um, that you may have heard of, Momentus, uh, you know, made a big splash that it was going to go public through a SPAC, um, and then it uh, went uh, public at a, a far reduced valuation to, to what it initially said it would. And so I think it, there are cautionary tales here for, it's not necessarily about SPACs, it's about the, the need the, of transparency, and, and Pip talked about trust. You know, what is the trusted value 
of a space asset or the services that it provides uh, over the, the lifespan of, of the investment that you want to make in it. So I've proposed and, and um, you know, I'm forming a space commodities exchange where there would be five buckets of commodities, uh, raw materials um, such as uh, lunar water, uh, processed goods, uh, services, we have a lot of that in low Earth orbit, LEO. Uh, LEO is not DiCaprio in this conversation. LEO is uh, low Earth orbit, Pip, just, just trying to be, be good here. Um, and um, uh, so services we do have a lot of. Uh, financial derivatives are under our regulatory regime in the States, uh, also commodities, so a swap uh, does the launch happen? People take one side of that bet, I'll take the other. That's a swap. Um, and then financial indexes, assume that, that I want in my retirement fund uh, to, to bet on all the commodity, uh, a basket of commodities for, for dealing with the moon. I could do that. Well, the, there are many, many reasons why a commodities exchange makes sense, but it, most of all, it makes transparent where supply and demand for particular commodities meet. Do they meet in 2025, 2030, 2040? Do they, uh, does that work in low Earth orbit and then in cislunar uh, space? So it, it demystifies and therefore de-risks the, um, the type of investment climate that you would have for space while also, and this comes back to, to Pip and our origins at, at Codex, um, creating a standard way of contracting for those commodities and enforcing those contracts. Uh, because in effect, the exchange stands behind and stands ready to enforce every contract that's, that's traded. Um, that's an oversimplification, but it, it it's pretty much true. Um, the reason I mention all this is that there is a different flavor of money for space needed at different points in the maturation of a space company or a technology that that company provides. And so you can't instantly qualify for certain when you're starting a company like uh, Momentus or, or others, SpaceX, you don't instantly qualify for certain flavors of money that, that are, are risk averse. Um, with that in mind, I've been, uh, with the help of the Air Force Research Lab folk, um, um, specifically Sean Ross there, Dr. Sean Ross, um, you know, it, it, figuring out what are the readiness levels that any entrepreneur, but particularly for space, go through to to earn the right to ask for or, or or to be worthy of a certain type of investment capital and many of you will know about trl or technology readiness levels um is it something is the technology something you can only demonstrate in the lab or is it proven mrl manufacturing readiness levels can you really uh, you know, produce this for, for sale, IRL, investor readiness levels, and then as you see, commodity ready, readiness level, because I need to be able to look across the horizon to define the commodity as it's matured to the point where it could be resold. So this is a good way uh, to have a little bit of discipline in the irrational exuberance to quote our, our former uh, Fed chair, uh, that, that could be space. And to say, you know, let's, and, and so what, what Sean and I have done, and, and Sean's brilliant at this, uh, Sean Ross at AFRL, is um, we've gone back and looked at the early aviators. So the Wright brothers and um, a motorcycle manufacturer named Glenn Curtis. Um, we looked at the early locomotive uh, manufacturers in the 1830s. And we see where, if you were ever two steps ahead in any of the levels of the other levels, you probably 
don't succeed in the end. And that's true for the Wright brothers. They, they did not create a successful company. And, and just to digress really quickly, the, the Wright brothers knew how to make bicycles before they started to try to make a, a, a flying machine, as they called it. Glenn Curtis had been building uh, motorcycles before he started with the help of Alex Alexander Graham Bell of the phone company fame and Tom Addison of electricity fame. So he was surrounded by some really good entrepreneurs. And, and Glenn Curtis, the difference between being able to build a bicycle and being able to build motorcycles is you have a really smart, um, lightweight engine to drive your propeller as opposed to human feet. And so you know who's going to win this, right? I, I, I've told you the bottom line here. And Curtis actually did. And he, you know, and, and there's a whole saga that you can read in a paper that, that we were preparing that explains kind of how the Wright brothers got themselves caught up in a patent war. Uh, and then World War I came and the American government said to both uh, sides, Glenn Curtis and the Wright brothers, knock it off, boys. We need the flying machines. We're going to go with Curtis and the rest is history. Um, so, so, you know, this also relates to how do you talk to investors about space? And, and what are they prepared to hear you say to them? Um, and, and how do you say it with, instead of lots of hand-waving and, and uh, claims of conquering the universe, which space could be accused of, um, how do you actually be truthful of, of where you are in, in um, uh, developing your technology and, and most importantly, the, where is the market for the technology that you think you can develop? Um, I, I throw this slide in because it's clear to me, In so I, I am a recovering Wall Street lawyer and Hong Kong merchant banker and geospatial technology finance pioneer for the federal government and 9-11 responder, and I do teach ethics and finance at Stanford. Um, and I think it's, it, it's important to see how institutional investors, pension funds, sovereign uh, family offices are looking to different flavors of um, types of instruments to invest in when they construct their portfolios of which infrastructure uh, instruments and, and bonds typically are a component and they've been performing very, very well historically, the infrastructure investments, because the last thing a government wants to do is to uh, have a toll road or whatever go bankrupt. That's not a good way to get reelected. Um, so, so there's... Um, you know, at least a slight an argument to be made that in addition to venture capital money and SPAC money, there is infrastructure finance money that could be mobilized to invest in space if space were by the governments created and, and managed over a longer term horizon uh, to be like critical infrastructure, like water and in energy and transportation and other, other infrastructures. Um, I've, I've actually weighed out the notion of space bonds. Um, uh, Pip, you, you would be disappointed if I didn't at this hour. Uh, and and um, uh, these are described in the report that you see here and, and that I've given um, Pip to distribute for you all. But, but what's interesting to me from, a, from an economic history point of view is that the Golden Gate Bridge, which, which probably many of you have been on or uh, seen photos of, that was actually financed uh, in, the, in the depths of the American Depression. And the local uh, counties went to Washington, uh, went to New York and said, you know, we, we, we need this bridge to, for all kinds of great commercial reasons for the, for the uh, area. And they were turned away. And they came back, and they raised the bonds locally. Um, they built the Golden Gate Bridge for about 20% less than the projected cost. 
And yes, they, they used the labor um, that was available because of the depression. So, so I think local finance or finance for the people who understand its value, coming back to the point of the space commodities exchange, if you know you're going to need a certain commodity, then your, the commodity you want to offer becomes more valuable because it's a cluster of other commodities that are being built simultaneously and funded at the right rate without booms and busts, without over and under investment. So uh, we, we've had over and under investment in railroads and many other things. So you see the, the railroad bond here as well. Um, but, but, but we've learned a lot in infrastructure finance terrestrially, some of which could be adapted certainly for space. Um, the the paper that just came out this week um, is called Space Budgeting for Modern Times, um, and I'm going to wrap up with that. Um, and, and really, it's a, uh, let us say, um, it's a call to the U.S. Office of Management and Budget and the U.S. Treasury to get on the ball here, <laughs> that the prime contractors... Um, Mean, meaning no dispersion here, uh, have been calling the tune of how we, we invest in space for far too long. And like in other critical infrastructures, the, in our system, um, while we do have um, elections every two to four years, the OMB is going to be there until my grandchildren are dead. I mean, they're just going to be there forever. The Treasury, the same. So if you want to look at who is the permanent investor for the U.S. government in space, I suggest to you those two are. And, and so what the report does is, is kind of tease apart OMB and Treasury's um, strategic missions and their... Uh, uh, the strategies that they want to implement for um, enterprise-wide or government-wide uh, sensibility and spending money on big things like space, and and it, and urges them to to really take take it on. Um, and and uh, my dealings in the geospatial realm and in other realms with those two groups have always impressed me that they do take their stewardship of long-term value um, creation and um, they're really serious about it and they, they have policies and people you know who are really expert at analyzing the critical um, impacts of under and over investment in, in specific things like infrastructure so I'm going to pause or, or stop there Pip because I think I'm I'm at time and, and um, uh, let, the, let the questions come into the chat and do whatever you tell me I'm supposed to do next. Um, well, I was actually just going to comment on that, Bruce. Thank you so much for that amazing presentation. Um, I'm a little awash with the figures because I'm just a lawyer. In fact, I'm just a fraud lawyer, so I was really hoping to scrutinise the documents. But um, I would say this, and I'm, I'm, I would love your comment on this, which is I'm going to make a comment really about how much space messes with appetite for risk as we know it in government and the private sector. I don't think since about the 1500s we have seen such an inversion in the way that appetite for risk plays out in both sending humans to their peril willingly for this amazing prize and then also willing to risk huge investments because you don't get a you don't get a rocket off the ground with any change from a lot of money more than I'll ever make in my own lifetime but for me I just can't think of a modern construct that so inverts that relationship with risk both in the private and the public sector so i'm, I'm not i don't know I, I think our i think our hedge fund uh friends would would find their own leverage to be um to be quite big um but but your point is well taken i i mean i i i, I don't understand what is accomplished by um 
uh, by the frivolous use of, of space travel, let us say, uh, that we've seen a bit of. Um, space, you're not an astronaut just because you put on a spacesuit and um, and put your seatbelt and fasten your seatbelt. And the FAA has made that very clear, the Federal Aviation Administration. Um, but you're right, there is a translation of risk that, well, let's step back. As lawyers, you and I are taught in law school and we, and we you know, teach, come up to the line of what is legal and, and look over it, but never go over it, right? Um, some of our peers don't necessarily practice that way, but that's the way we practice. Engineers are taught, here are the constraints, and if yeah. you don't observe those constraints, something really, really bad is going to happen. If you don't build the building to earthquake proof, not a good idea. I totally agree. If, if, you, if you don't test the drug, not a good idea. Yeah. So, um, so there's this confluence in the uh, professional understanding of risk and quantifying risk and managing towards risk. Uh, that that are different, whether it's a lawyer or an engineer or a banker. And bankers love risk because they can buy and sell it if there's a market, which is the exchange's purpose. So so I think it's it's really important that when you're trying to understand the risk of, of, of some un, unknown like space or climate change or some of the other unknowns that, that our complex world is dealing with, that you, that you really do as good as you can of naming the risk and then seeing if the way you've named the risk conforms to the way the risk behaves. Um, so, so I, you know, I, but I agree, the frivolous use of space or the frivolous use of energy or the frivolous use of, of nuclear power would be uh, uh, concerning. <laughs> Okay, no, that's amazing. Well, thank you, Bruce. Um, well, let's switch a little bit um, in uh, topic, but I will say there will be a bit of a discussion of this distinction between astronauts and space tourists. I'm gonna to share my screen. And for those of you who joined late, I am not Cassandra, I am Pip, but I am stepping in as darling Cassandra, who is a genuine space expert, is actually not well today. Um, so can I just ask my wonderful colleague, Damien, can you just give me a thumbs up if you're looking at my slide? Because sometimes Zoom can mess with, and one more thumbs up if it's just advanced to a picture of YouTube. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the Kessler syndrome. Um, and then I promise this will be one of very few puns, but other space law matters of gravity. Um, I'll leave the puns there. Yeah, thank you, Bruce. Thank you. I know you're. I know you're on mute, but I can tell you're laughing. And so is Damien. Thank you. But what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the Kessler syndrome as a bit of a hook for us to then just spread out, spread out a little bit our view, and just say, well, what is the syndrome? What's the problem? And then let's just have a look at what the law has been doing to date to try and manage not just that, if indeed it has but whether it's fit for purpose moving forward. And spoiler alert, it's not really fit for purpose. It's, it's limping along behind the technology as it always does, um, and it, it's not keeping up. But that's what this is all about. That's what these sorts of events are about, because we can do a bit of a gap analysis. We can talk about it, and maybe we could even um, beg the question, perhaps it should just wait a little bit and see what everything looks like. So... This is a screen grab. I was going to show the YouTube clip and then I just thought, oh dear, you're messing with technology and Wi-Fi and let's just go with the screen grab. You can find this yourselves on YouTube. This is a clip from a news item from a number of years ago in which it is reported that two communication satellites were lost in space after a Russian rocket failed to place them into orbit. So experts said that these satellites now pose a risk in their own right. And that's because they can become space debris. And at the time, the particular technology that was at risk was the International Space Station. 
So this occurred in 2014. You know, this is a while ago. This is a good seven years ago. But about um, five months ago, in 2021, a piece of debris smacked into a robot arm. This is the robotic arm of the International Space Station. And it left a little hole which operators noticed during a routine inspection. Now, no one was injured and the arm continued to operate as it should, so it was still functional, but the incident calls to attention this problem about space debris. Something breaks in space and it then becomes an obstacle that could become a problem while it's in orbit. Now, let's do a bit of ground clearing. I'm talking about the same space that Bruce referred to, the LEO, Low Earth Orbit. We're not talking about big asteroids that circle around the sun. Yes, they're a risk to the entire planet. What I'm talking about is tiny little bits of debris that are floating around Earth's orbit in the low Earth orbit and that are man-made. Now, there are there is some natural debris floating around in amongst that maelstrom, but actually the problem is the man-made stuff. That's what we're addressing when we talk about the Kessler syndrome. So this image that I have on slide four shows a tiny little bit of space infrastructure with one of those massive meteors or asteroids. And I will just confirm that is not what I'm talking about. Yes, the collision of these two things would be problematic, but this isn't the bigger problem. The bigger problem is clouds of little items. And this is a really good image here on slide five of a small items impact on the International Space Station. It shows that a smallish item that can be measured down to the centimeters, apologies, Bruce, for the metric system, you'll cope. Um, and then we have this massive impact created by the small circular piece that you see reflected in that image. And what it's trying to depict is the powerful physics behind the speed at which something small arrives and hits an opposite thing that's also moving incredibly fast. And when it hits that external shell, no matter how much is invested in protecting those shells, they are vulnerable to attack. So what does this have to do with the Kessler syndrome? Well, let's go to that great font of all knowledge, Sandra. Sandra's going to help us to answer the question. This is, this is an image of Sandra Bullock on slide seven with um, a screenshot of the poster for Gravity, the 2013 movie featuring Sandra and George Clooney. And what we know from Sandra is that in this film, we have a space shuttle called Explorer commanded by a veteran astronaut, Matt Kowalski, and it's in Earth's orbit to service the Hubble Space Telescope. And Dr. Ryan Stone, played by our heroine, Sandra Bullock, is aboard on her first space mission, of course, it would have to be her first flight, to perform a set of hardware upgrades. Now, mid-service, mid mid-procedure, cloud of space debris just ends up in their orbit and all is lost on the main station that they were operating from and George and Sandra have now just got this little man-made unit this man manned unit and they have to now try and get their way back but the problem is they've got to get their way back to the International Space Station but in 90 minutes that orbiting cloud of dust these particles of man-made artificial space debris are going to come back to them again and it's now worse and it's worse because it includes all of the debris from the first impact. Now let's hear what Donald has to say about this. This is Donald J. Kessler after whom the syndrome is named. Now he actually co-authored the article in which all of this is explained. So where the co-author's name is, I don't know, but we'll give it to Donald that maybe, maybe he posted something to the equivalent of a 1970s LinkedIn to just park that this was his idea. But basically what the Kessler syndrome says is, once you have this impact and you've got these particles going around, you now have a chain reaction. This is not a simple algorithmic event. 
it's not just an effect. You have a chain reaction. You have a series, a cascading series of effects because that cloud is bigger. It's going to hit more and more things. Everything it hits becomes more um, incinerated, creates more cloud dust. Eventually, you have so much rubbish and debris floating around in orbit in the LEO, the low Earth orbit, that all of the infrastructure up there that's operating to service GPS, communication systems, the internet, they're now all at risk. And this phenomenon can actually be described by some in quite sort of catastrophic, world-changing terms. Let's park that. I don't think it's completely unrealistic. And that's because this hypothetical doomsday scenario includes not just the collapse of those, other, those systems, but we've got weather measuring systems, we've got um, mobile phone connection systems. Um, personally here, just in sleepy little delegate, one of the smallest country towns in Australia, we would collapse without these systems. So I decided to do a search on ANU's library to find the first piece of published scholarship that refers to the Kessler syndrome. And I found a master's paper from a Canadian student at McGill. And it's actually really helpful. It, it is 100% about the international law and artificial space debris, but it's dated 1990. So even this is getting old now. We need to, we need to sort of catch up and move on. We're 31 years later. And what this notes in this paper is that this self-generation of space debris in Earth's orbit results in this continual cloud of space debris and it can impair the utilization of systems. It's cascading. It makes everything extremely vulnerable to collision while it's in that low Earth orbit. The New York Times commented on this in a paper written in 2007. So it's picked up something from the International Herald Tribune, which, you know, these are articles of weight, you know, they're, what would you call them, good grey literature. Interestingly, the New York Times fails to identify a key element of the problem. It keeps talking about orbital obstacles and the size of them and how they could hit your space station or in the Curtis case, I guess it's a flying motorcycle that's found its way into space. But it misses the key point, which is that there are way more undetectable, untrackable pieces. And even back in 2007, technology was not really ready for the kind of sensors you need to see the real problem as it's spinning around in the LEO. So this is the kind of image that you get. If you look this up on the internet, if you decide to Google this sort of concept, the Kessler syndrome, space debris, you'll see it looking like that. But in between all of those visible pieces, there would be the untrackable items. And NASA and various space agencies, including the European Space Agency, are onto it. They have been writing a lot about this problem and trying to work out what do we do about what is now known as the orbital space debris. So it encompasses natural meteoroids and then we've got these artificial orbital debris pieces. And the orbital or human made stuff is no longer serving any function. It's complete space junk. A lot of it may be big bits of stuff that are no longer in use, or they could be these tiny pieces that are the remnants of collisions. Altogether, they create enormous risk. So this is what the European Space Agency says as at now are the sorts of things we're looking at. 29,000 pieces over 10 centimetres. So they've got an image there, an icon of a softball. 750,000 pieces that are one centimetres. So we're talking ping pong ball or table tennis ball in that image. And then we've got 166 million pieces that are the size of or smaller than marbles. And this is a problem. So what can space law do to intervene? Space law sits within international, public international space law, and it has at its heart five pieces, five instruments that are very interesting for this discussion. We've got right in the middle, the very first original piece of legislation, an outer space treaty, which is really an international instrument for people to, to buy into, for major organisations. 
Now, let's be clear. In 1967, when the US, the UK, and what was then the Soviet Union signed up to this, we're talking about governments. And this is the piece Bruce is alluding to. Where do space tourists fit into this structured set of instruments that speak to astronauts and cosmonauts and the work of people who have a background maybe in engineering and aviation and then you go into the role of flying the craft, taking responsibility for the instruments on the craft, not just sitting inside the craft, sunning yourself under a solar lamp and updating your Facebook status, which is what I would do if I was a space tourist. But this is really important because these treaties speak to governing the activities of states, not, not private entities, states, in the exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies. And then we've got the 1968 rescue agreement. So agreeing to rescue whom? Astronauts, not tourists, astronauts, including cosmonauts, of course, let's, let's not forget the Russians. Um, the 1972 liability convention, which is all gonna be about, well, who's gonna be liable? Um, and how do we distinguish between innocent, fraudulent, negligent, acts that impact outer space or impact infrastructure or land on earth. There's a distinction. Then we've got the 1975 registration convention. This is the notion that you've got to register your spacecraft with the UN, with the registration body before you can fly your thing up into space. So has Elon Musk registered his latest piece of equipment? I mean, these are really interesting questions when, um, What's the name of the soft drink? Red Bull sent the guy up into space. It was he in low orbit? There's a lot of debate about whether or not he actually was in space. A lot of people go, no, 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 you weren't. You were below that line. I won't go there now. And then we've got the moon agreement, the 1979 moon agreement. And that's just all about, you know, you can't own the moon. Um, and uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of debate over what the extent is of that kind of legislation or treaty. Now, these treaties form the core of what we would call the international space law that was formed between the 50s up to the 80s. But the international community has had to cope with a lot more since then. The military use of space, the use of space for communications services, for geospatial signaling, signaling for weather reporting, there is a lot more. What I would call official use. So official government infrastructure use of space but now we're moving into this world of space tourism and it really tests the boundaries of these treaties. Now, it could be that you could argue, well, don't worry about it, they're just not bound by the treaties. But the problem with that is people who go into space may actually expect to be able to rely on some of these um, instruments. For example, you know, if something occurred to the Sandra Bullock character, but she was a space tourist, would anyone go to her rescue? And would they be required to? Would there be any kind of obligation? The rescue agreement says that it's for the return of astronauts and space objects. And it always makes me think of those kind of, you know, salvage arrangements that we know about from history in relation to ships and things like that. But here we are, here we are in 2021, and this is the sort of thing we read. This um, piece, Whose Rocket is Bigger? I'm not even gonna ask Dr. Freud to speak on that one, but how Mask Branson and Bezos space stuff stacks up. And it does really, really beg the question, well, well, who's going to win on this little commercial race that we're seeing? But also what can we expect legally is gonna be the liability if their space stuff either starts interfering with stuff in the low earth orbit. Are they gonna take responsibility for damage that their systems might cause to critical infrastructure? Or what, what happens if some of it falls to earth? Now, let's be realistic. That's probably on takeoff or landing and causes damage. You see that with the, um, uh, what do they call it? It's, it's the Cosmodrome, the Cosmodrome in Russia which has a whole lot of debris that lands on the steps, the Kazakh steps, and people then go and rescue it and salvage it and then try and sell parts and materials. It's pretty dangerous. Um, a lot of nuclear reactors and lithium leaking out of those. But 
when we think about Elon Musk and we think about Richard Branson and we think about what Bezos wants to achieve in their race to develop space tourism, I think Bruce's financial exchanges and systems become very, very interesting because there's a lot of risk not just within the project and, and its expectations financially, for example, for raising money from space tourists, but also its relationship with third-party contractors and third parties who may be agents, funders, investors, and or strangers and others who are impacted, not necessarily always in a positive way, by those activities. So it, the, the risk for me, the quotient, and I know Bruce is all over this, it is really expansive once you do introduce tourism, which explains why Bruce was going, they're not astronauts. And that's important. It is not a throwaway line from Bruce. When you look at the structure of these treaties and the way that the law has been developed, it's a really important question. So a few of the current issues regarding space law that have really found their way into the 21st century include things like, what is the role of the private sector in outer space? How do we review current legislation and policies in relation to their activities? How do we apply domestic laws to their behavior? Um, and I was exchanging a Facebook message with someone yesterday about what if you defame someone while they're in between two space stations? Which jurisdiction do you fall under? Can you then call it into some domestic jurisdiction? What is the adequacy of existing international liability regime to protect space tourists? And as we see an increase in military activity, what kind of transparency do we have when an acting international agent, state agent says, oh, this is, this is just for research and development. This is just for tourism. And yet we need declarations and laws that govern whether or not that's actually just hiding and masking military activity. And I'm not saying that in relation to either Musk, Bezos or Branson. That's just a bit of a disclaimer from Dr. Pippi, just to say I'm not, I'm not in any way impugning their activities. I'm just trying to create a series of hypothetical scenarios so that we can test the law. So here we are in the 21st century with the equivalent of commercial salvage operations happening now, apparently, in space. And it, and it does beg the question, what, for example, would the Chinese government think if a bunch of Australians head up into space to recover one of their now disabled satellites? Would the Chinese say, oh, yes, we've abandoned that and it's open for salvage? Or would they say, hang on, hang on, hang on. That's just sitting there until we recover it on a further space mission. And it contains a whole lot of sensitive data. It might have a whole lot of their IP in, in the designs inside that. I don't think a European or Chinese space agency would be particularly happy for a bunch of Aussies to just go and start salvaging apparently abandoned or disused equipment. So while we see the increasing role of the private sector, there is going to be a need for these entrepreneurs to ask, what is the legal frame within which we are working? And there is a bit of a legal vacuum at the moment, and it's left in place because the treaties don't speak to this, and commercial space activity is still open to debate in relation to the legal context in which it's operating. And I mean, it's these legal va vacuums that just create a whole wonderland for barristers like me, who just think, oh, bring it on, give me the brief. I I'd be very, very happy to take that, knowing that there's really no precedent in any direction and it's worthy of a good, a good battle in the courts. Um, and there are going to be, there's going to be a very strong appetite for that kind of litigation. Um, litigation is, of course, just the start. The advice, the commercial in, in, um, contracts um, and agreements are going to be needed and they're going to be need, need to be framed in a way that, that satisfies investors so that they feel comforted in backing whatever that next project is. Um, I would like to think that these tourists, as we see on this wonderful graphic, um, are actually surrounded by stars rather than space debris. That's what I'd like to think is going on in the background. Um, one of the things that I was wondering when I looked at this graphic was the phenomenon of the overview effect, which a number of you may have heard about, but apparently it's almost universal that if somebody goes into space and then looks back at Earth, they experience a thing called the overview effect. 
And this is a, a sense of having seen Earth from afar. And it's a phenomenon that then tends to um, invoke ideas of the Earth's fragility. And apparently people experiencing this go back to Earth and become almost universally, without exception, very heavily involved in environmental projects and wanting to basically save the planet. I mean, you could do it, you could write a thesis on environmental sustainability, human security, the future of humans around this notion of the future of space travel, but also what to do about the space effect as well. Um, so when we think about space debris and we think about environment, um, environmental aspects of the law, we could ask ourselves, are engineers going to be bound by the ethical constraints that demand that engineers and also the, anyone using international standards have to now invoke the UN's sustainable development goals, including environmental sustainability? I think this is something that is going to be playing a really, really big part in the future of the way space develops. Um, and it can include the Kessler syndrome and, and thinking about how are we gonna clean it up? So that, so that we think about space that really needs to be a place that's a lot cleaner and a lot more um, uh, environmentally friendly. Sorry, it's got to go back to this. So now this is this is an agency. This is the Interagency for Debris Coordination, and it's a committee that has been set up with a number of member nations. And what they're trying to do is deal with this problem that is posed when we talk about the Kessler syndrome, taking the debris and saying we need to reduce it, we need to minimise it, we need to prevent it, and we need to start cleaning it up. Now, there's a number of spacecraft envisaged that could actually start to clean up the debris. We've seen Spacewatch, um, a project announced by the European Space Agency in, in, in which it's going to start awarding cleanup contracts. And of course, there could be questions about could you recycle some of the stuff so that you can offset the costs of going up to do the recycling? Surely if the, you're the recycler, you should have salvage rights in relation to whatever it is, is captured in that net. But the problem is you might have been sent to go and catch tuna and instead you've got dolphins in there. And that analogy is actually important because we see these kinds of technologies being used in the oceans. You want to pick up the plastic, but you end up picking up the tuna and the dolphin and you don't want to capture the wrong fish. I think these nets, the idea about using magnets is a lot more realistic than some of the other suggestions. Um, the sun, that great, that great repository for all intellectual thinking, came up with this wonderful headline, Elon Musk's Starlink satellites could ruin space travel forever. Terrifying Kessler syndrome explained. So if you didn't like my explanation, go to this copy of The Sun from last year, where they are talking very seriously about how there are too many objects in the lower Earth orbit. They're increasing the risk of collision. A single collision could launch the domino effect. Is Elon Musk just going to send more equipment up into space to clean up the very problem that his equipment in space is creating. I think we have a catch-22 occurring there. And when challenged about this, Elon Musk on Twitter replied to the question, hey, Elon, outside of Starlink, which you have changed orbit to lessen the impact, see Kessler syndrome, has SpaceX thought of a way to try to eventually collect space debris? And his reply is, oh, yeah, we can fly Starship around space and chomp up debris with the moving fairing door. This is, this is the high-level response from Elon, multi-billion dollar investor and spender of other people's unicorn funds and angel investing dollars and other currencies, including Bitcoin. Um, this image is not Elon Musk's fairing door. I stole this from... Um, is it you only live twice? Um, but that is the fairing door. That's the idea. You've got this big Mo chomping. Moonraker. Moonraker. Oh, is it Moonraker? Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> Moonraker, I apologise to all the Bond fans out there, including Bruce, clearly. Um, 
this is the fairing door, but you know, this, this is contemplating. If, if Elon is saying, I'm gonna clean up all the space, space debris, I've got a chomper with the fairing door, that completely misses the point that what we really need is the nets and the magnets. That's the way that we're going to deal with this problem. So let's come to the end. It's half past the hour, which is when I said I would finish up with mine. What we know is that under the existing treaties, the rescue agreement focuses on the return of personnel and, and assistance to astronauts who conduct activities for the benefit and in the interest of all countries. That's the principle behind the treaty. They're there to risk their lives for the betterment of the world. The problem is, do the space, space tourists fall within that category? And dare I say it, will the parts of their equipment and these Sandra Bullock type revolving human beings just become part of the LEO debris? Um, I know it's a horrible thought, but the image I have there is of this floating astronaut. And for me, for the Kessler syndrome to be resolved, we need the nets, we need the magnets, we need to clean up the debris, and then we'll also be one step closer towards achieving item six, number six of the UN Sustainable Goals. So um, that's the end of the presentation on behalf of me and... Um, hey, hey, Pip, can I weigh in for a couple of things? Because I think you've really triggered a, a great conversation. Um, if, if I could just take a minute. Please, um, please. Um, first of all, uh, it's my understanding that the way that space objects were uh, designed, they were designed to last 15 years and then burn up in the atmosphere. So there, the engineers and their code of conduct um, might be uh, subject to a little bit of uh, scrutiny. And, and uh, uh, you know, if they were performing to their code of conduct, was that malpractice? Probably not. Um, so now we have to deal with that. Um, second, you have a tragedy of the commons problem, as you've described it with space debris and the Kessler syndrome, uh, just like pollution in, in, uh, uh, in the ocean, who's responsible. Um, and with regard to, to the uh, act of law, the, um, the, the launching state, uh, whoever launches the object, is the, is the law that applies to um, its, let's say, negligence or liability. And so you might, uh, on the International Space Station, if you are slip and fall on the Russian side, you're suing under Russian law. If you do it under, uh, on the U.S. side, you're suing under U.S. law. Um, the Space Commodities Exchange, as it's designed, would allow for the commercial operators uh, to agree amongst themselves as to the permission to claim that debris of a fellow member by saying, I'm, I'm about to go get your debris. If you want to get it, go get it. If you want to part partner with me, let's partner. And, and so um, it is a middle ground through the rule book of an exchange to try to fill the void that you really accurately um, put your finger on in the space treaties because they were designed in the Cold War era to not have nuclear proliferation up there, which question mark. Um, but nonetheless, it, they didn't think about commercial space. So, so in this middle period before you can get people to sign treaties, which is increasingly very difficult uh, for the for UNUSA, um, you, you could have this kind of uh, mutual aid and um, mutual agreement through an exchange rule book to, to say this is how we're going to treat each other. So I, I, I think you're right to point to these issues, but, but we do have ways to, to address them. And some of us have been working really hard to, to move that forward. So thank I, you. I love the notion out. that financial, financial systems can come up with solutions where there's a gap. Um, and that really speaks to the idea that money changes everything. You know, when, you, when you've got that and you've got that urgency, it needs must, needs must, and it will find a way. I think that's great. And it's, it's a very... Well, and, and, and we've kind of run out of the insurance industry's capacity to take the carrying ability of this sure. planet 
and, uh, with climate change and other risks and, and natural catastrophe uh, settlements and, and ensure whatever goes on to Sandra and, and George Clooney up there. I mean, at some <laughs> point you can't afford them to be yeah. space tourists and be insured. Yeah, no, no, that's cool. That's very cool. Um, now, Dr. Damien Clifford, I think we're going to go into our personal galaxies now and explore a little bit of cyberspace, um, which is our way of very happily bringing um, cyber into this whole story. So, Damien, over to you. Uh, thanks, Pip. Um, I think... Um, I suppose when I was asked to do this, I was slightly afraid that this would be such a sharp departure from what had gone before that um, it'd be a bit of a struggle to find the connection. Um, but I, I thought maybe to start, I just had a few reflections on, you know, the regulation of cyberspace generally and the history behind, it because, you know, there are some commonalities, I suppose, in some of the things that you were discussing around uh, the regulated, uh, you know, the regulation of, of space um, and, I suppose some of the similar conversations that we had about regulation of cyberspace. Um, and that, I suppose, you know, when you're looking back in it on uh, the early days of the internet in terms of, um, uh, you know, cyberspace regulation, there was a more of a libertarian approach to say that you couldn't regulate this space at all. You know, I mean, it was extremely uh, difficult given the transboundary effect of a lot of the technologies that we were uh, speaking about. Um, however, there was kind of a I suppose, a dawning realization in the literature that came uh, with more of a realist approach, indicating that there was already a significant amount of law that was applicable uh, to the regulation of cyberspace. Um, and I suppose that that's where my intervention comes. Now, I think maybe a little bit of the inspiration as to why I was asked to speak today um, comes from the maybe slightly deceptive title on a book chapter that I wrote. Um, that's on the slide, I mean, the, the starting slide, which I hope you can see. So the, the citizens, consumers in a personalized galaxy, promotion, influence, decision making, a true path, path to the dark side. Now, I'm not generally in the, um, you know, uh, someone who, um, well, I mean, at a certain point I was, but there was a specific reason why I um, uh, chose such uh, an evocative, shall we say, uh, title for this uh, chapter. It was included in an edited collection that came out of uh, what is known as the Geeky Con Conference. So a geek law conference, and I was actively encouraged to use puns and link it to popular culture. Um, so, you know, that's kind of... Um, you know, the, the, the reason for it, and perhaps maybe even the reason why I was asked today. Um, I mean, the connection, uh, I mean, the focus of uh, this piece, this uh, chapter, and I suppose my uh, work generally is on the regulation of cyberspace. And it has focused quite a lot on artificial intelligence, and in particular, emotional AI, uh, which I'll come to in a bit, and the effects of that. Um, so I look quite a, a lot at data privacy protections, but also consumer protection law and the application of those frameworks uh, to um, the regulation of um, cyberspace. But when I started reflecting a little bit on the title of today's event, you know, the lost and found in, uh, well, in my case, cyberspace, um, uh, I was obviously drawn, given my data privacy focus, to the, the loss of data and the surveillance technologies which pervade our uh, online experiences. Uh, and, you know, the intensive data gathering which uh, underpins most of the commercial, um, you know, how the internet actually works. So, I mean, it un under underpins the, the commercial reality and the businesses behind uh, the internet. Um, so I suppose in that kind of sense, uh, maybe, um, you're never truly lost on the internet. I mean, you're always findable, trackable, and traceable. Um, and I think that that's kind of the starting off point for this particular piece of research, which I will you know, come to in a minute and I'll do a few sl slides on. So uh, once I'm finished with this overarching linking, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that that was kind of um, where I was coming from it. I mean, and perhaps the only place where you're lost online is in, in terms of information overload. Um, and that plays uh, a role as well in terms of how we regulate and how we regulate cyberspace in that sense. Now, I suppose um, one of the major differences 
with what has gone before. Uh, obviously, I mean, traditionally, uh, when we think about law and, and space, we're, as Pip uh, explained very well, we're talking about, you know, the law between states. Um, I'm really focused on, I suppose, how technologies intersect with individuals, individual citizens or individual consumers. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll start with a little bit of a description of like, okay, well, what do I mean by this uh, path to the dark side in terms of emotional AI um, and what regulation looks like in terms of cyberspace of um, uh, emotion influenced decision making given uh, technological developments uh, in artificial intelligence. Um, sorry, let will just see if I can move my slides on. So um, there are a whole host of examples, I suppose, of, um, you know, uh, that are probably well within, you know, the memory of pop or culture at the moment in terms of um, uh, effects of emotional uh, AI or um, effective computing, as it's more broadly known, uh, within, um, you know, uh, that have, have been discussed, uh, 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 very well discussed, I suppose, in the broad stream media as well. Um, we have example, I mean, Facebook in this regard is kind of like a gift that keeps on giving in terms of examples. So you can start with their emotional contagion experiment in which they uh, essentially figured out that through the manipulation of user feeds, they could uh, have an influence on how users then engaged with uh, the platform uh, in terms of you know, uh, the, the um, emotion underpinning some of their posts that they then posted on the, um, on the platform. We have um, Facebook in this jurisdiction reportedly having told advertisers that they could target insecure teens um, so uh, another probably slightly shocking example, uh, we have loads of patents around uh, the capacity to uh, detect emotion and personalize on that basis. And we have, I suppose, most famously now the Cambridge Analytica scam scandal, which uh, used uh, to a certain extent, I suppose, emotion manipulation um, for what or at least persuasion in order to push uh, people in particular directions uh, uh, for uh, you know political ends, I suppose, in terms of the referendum and the uh, US uh, Trump election, I suppose. Um, so we have lots of examples, but there's also a whole host of other companies, both big and small, um, uh, that are involved in this space. And it is very much uh, a multi-billion uh, dollar industry. Um, now, um, largely speaking, I, I mean, I just put up a few definitions as to you know, what it is I'm talking about. And there's been, I suppose, a large debate about this stemming back from, I suppose, Rosin. Uh, Picard's uh, discussion of effective computing um, uh, in you know the, the late 90s. Um, so, but even beyond that, emotion detection is far from a new phenomenon. You know, so there's uh, uh, all that we have really uh, these days is perhaps an increased capacity to do so, uh, given the fact that we have an increasing datification of our online platforms. Um, how this is done, I suppose, there's a various means. So you have from text and data mining uh, to voice analysis, use of smart devices, you can have uh, the analysis of facial expressions. Um, now, there are also then, as you would imagine, a whole host of applications, both within the public sector and the private sector. Uh, a major concern uh, and part of this uh, discussion has been around the accuracy of such systems. Yeah, so uh, the potential fallout, uh, legal and ethical, uh, that comes from the deployment of these systems, given the fact that there are uh, key concerns given their method methodological foundations. So um, you have uh, the NYU AI Now Institute suggesting that, um, you know, that these technologies are essentially bogus. Uh, similarly, Kay Crawford in her book, uh, Atlas of AI, has suggested that uh, some of the methodolog methodologies underpinning several of these technologies um, are um, essentially pseudoscience. So there's been uh, an active pushback uh, against some of the developments. Um, now, a lot of this is focused on the use of facial, facial expressions as a proxy for um, uh, uh, emotion uh, and then the, the methodological challenges that stem from that. Um, but I, the work that um, I suppose um, maybe 
uh, inspired Pip to ask me to, to speak about this and the connection, I suppose, with uh, cyberspace, uh, really focused on uh, emotion monetization uh, and what it actually means. Um, now, within the article, and I suppose the work I've done broadly on this topic, uh, I have categorized it uh, generally into the four bullet points on uh, the slide. So there's uh, emotional appeal of a particular product, um, uh, you can have the emotional appeals of uh, means of delivering uh, commercial communication. There's an ability to leverage emotion detection or improvement as a selling point. So if you have emotional AI as a feature within a particular app or product or whatever else, and then you have a combination of all these to increase the capacities uh, facilitated by technological developments. And I suppose, um, you know, emotional AI uh, fits uh, across all these three, uh, these four, I suppose, with the last one um, essentially uh, representing a combination. Um, so to kind of give you uh, some examples of what I mean, so you have very famous John Lewis ads in the UK, um, you know, that are uh, extremely um, well known around the Christmas period that are extremely evocative, yeah, so they get um, a strong emotional reaction from uh, their audiences. And emotional AI, for instance, has been used in the development of uh, such ads. Yeah, so the further personalization or optimization of commercial campaigns. You have uh, where emotion can be a feature, with, uh, you know, I mean, a feature of the product itself. So uh, this is an advert, um, essentially an advert game. Yeah. So the means of commercialization is in itself uh, evoking uh, an emotional reaction. And such things as well are, uh, I suppose, optimized um, in order to extract, I suppose, the, the most profit that you possibly can on the basis of emotion insights. Uh, and then you have the particular features of uh, where uh, emotion monetization is part of a product uh, or service. So we have a lot, I suppose, within wearable devices these days as to, you know, these um, healthcare or pseudo healthcare applications uh, purportedly uh, saying that they can uh, detect uh, and uh, emotion uh, so that you can monitor it for your well-being. Um, now, um, you may wonder, I suppose, uh, why I'm particularly concerned or why I thought it was a good idea to start looking at this in uh, that particular book chapter, um, especially, I suppose, given the fact that there are uh, key concerns given the underlying methodologies, etc. Um, but, um, you know, I thought that even if we take, uh, you know, that there may be some effectiveness of the technologies or they may develop over time to a place where there's some degree of accuracy in their capacity to predict uh, and uh, result in personalizations uh, that actually have an impact. It does raise uh, uh, concerns, I suppose, uh, regarding the unvi ongoing viability of legal protections uh, afforded within uh, law generally. Um, and here I'm looking at the, you know, enduring rev uh, relevance of uh, standards such as the, the reasonable or credulous consumer or the average consumer, I suppose, within uh, certain EU law protections, for instance. Um, and uh, I'm concerned, I suppose, about that a little bit, uh, given the fact that we're living in a society, society, as I mentioned at the very outset of my intervention, that is increasingly datafied. Uh, and mediated by these large technological platforms. So we have, I suppose, uh, an abundance of research pointing at the capacity for uh, bias to be harnessed for commercial gain. Uh, so there's uh, um, articles written, for instance, by uh, authors such as Hansen and Kaiser on market manipulation that has been adopted into digital market manipulation by, uh, say, Ryan Kahlo uh, in his discussion of the capacity for the increased datification of cyberspace and then the capacity to personalize on that basis in order to extract more profit and direct uh, individuals towards uh, commercial goals, yeah? Um, and I was wondering a little bit at the outset of that research as to, well, how does emotion fit within that and what does it mean for legal protections? Um, because at least in my understanding of the law and uh, I suppose the way I was always taught it is that uh, to a certain extent, the law remains uh, quite separate. Uh, um, emotion uh, remains quite separate from rational decision making in terms of what we think in the law. So we have this uh, quotation from Maloney here, who basically says that the law works from the perspective of emotions uh, belonging to separate spheres of human existence, 
existence, the sphere of law admits only of reason, and the vigilant policing is required to keep emotion from creeping in where it does not belong. And there's a whole range of law and emotion scholarship dealing largely with, I suppose, judicial capacity to make decisions and the effects of emotion on uh, judges uh, making decisions in courtrooms. But it also extends out then, uh, at least in my view, to our capacity to make decisions uh, in a commercial context and what that means for uh, legal regulation and the ongoing viability of legal regulation. Um, and this becomes more apparent when you think of things like uh, insights from decision theory, um, where you have authors such as uh, Lerner uh, and others essentially su uh, summarizing the literature by saying that put succinctly, emotion and decision making go hand in hand with emotion acting as the dominant driver for most meaningful decisions in life. So if we have this kind of uh, separation between emotion and uh, uh, I suppose, um, uh, uh, rational, rationality uh, in the law, what does it mean for our ongoing protections uh, as provided in uh, things like consumer protection? Um, and I suppose uh, my work uh, to a large extent then has said, okay, well, um, well, what's the role of regulation more broadly here? Yeah, so we could look at the sharp end of the stake in terms of the effects of this datification and personalization, what that comes out of it. But could we not just focus on the other end of the, uh, the, the chain, I suppose, yeah? So instead of focusing on the outputs, you focus on the inputs and the protection of the information. Um, and uh, the question here is, well, you know, could the data privacy frameworks or data protection frameworks in Europe essentially provide the protection that we need? Yeah? Because I suppose if you control the data, then you control the outputs to which it's used. Uh, and that's, I suppose, maybe an oversimplification uh, in light of several things, but that's uh, this, the fundamental premise uh, of um, uh, the beginnings of that uh, argument in, in, the, in the chapter. So within that, um, you know, uh, it's important to realize that within data protection uh, or data privacy frameworks, there are key challenges in terms of the application of those frameworks, given the fact that they're largely principle based. And uh, I guess that this points generally and maybe some insights could be drawn from this uh, more broadly in terms of how regulation and reg um, regulations are constructed. Yeah? Uh, so there's the technology neutral approach that is adopted in order to ensure the, the longstanding um, uh, capacity for these types of laws to um, uh, regulate uh, emerging technologies. Uh, but there's a certain amount to which, um, you know, that's questioned the capacity for the regulator to do it. Uh, so we end up with uh, certainly within a data privacy space with these uh, principle based frameworks that are extremely context dependent that result in, I suppose, uh, potential variation in terms of how they're uh, complied with. So it results in difficulties in compliance for the businesses doing uh, these types of operations. But aside from that, um, you know, Another question you can ask uh, is whether there are uh, more questions uh, actually in practice. And this is my last slide. And I left it as my last slide because basically I could talk for an hour on each of these three points, but I thought that I would um, maybe keep it short given the fact that we're almost at five to, uh, and I'm under strict instructions from PIP to make sure that, uh, you know, that we don't run over seven o'clock definitely. Um, but I just thought I would highlight each of these points as being potentially problematic uh, within the application of uh, the frameworks in question to uh, mitigating the challenges of uh, a technology like emotional AI or AI generally uh, for that matter. And these, I suppose, are the key contributions of that particular chapter. So the first one is... Um, you know, uh, to what extent some of these technologies squarely fit within the definitions of personal data and personal information. Um, they're, now, that's probably, um, you know, context dependent a little bit as well, so I won't go into it too much. But um, the second part of that sentence is far more interesting. So the blurred lines with the sensitive data categories. Now, within data privacy frameworks, there are sensitive data uh, categories that are protected, such as health data, for instance, that are afforded additional protections um, uh, for good reason. Um, but you know, what? Uh, how do you classify uh, something like emotional 
uh, information revealing someone's emotion? Is it health data? Is it not health data? Could it be classified as biometric data, which in several jurisdictions, it does fit within uh, the definition of sensitive personal information. But there are a lot of uncertainties, I suppose, as to how the regulation would intersect with these technologies. The second one is one that is going to be familiar to all of us in that, um, what does consent mean online, essentially? Yeah. Um, and how do you operationalize our capacity to consent properly when we have no idea what's actually happening? Uh, we've no idea of the extent to which the information is gathered, uh, and that relates largely to asymmetries of power uh, and information. And the last one then is uh, the limitations of an ex ante uh, focused regulation, uh, given the fact that I suppose a lot of the harms that we're concerned with are ex post. Um, so uh, in light of the time, um, I think I will leave it at that and hand back to you, Pip. Thank you, Damien. Can I can I ask a question in relation to this? Just because we've got, we'll give you a, one more minute on this question. Are, are we going to start seeing people overthinking their facial expressions and interactions online to ensure that they convey the meaning they need to convey? Um, and so you get this kind of recursion happening between the system that reads you and how you then send the messages. Is that? Is that part of the discourse or is that a bridge too far at this time? Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose the, because of the questions of as to accuracy, then um, there would be a question as to the need for that. I think the bigger discussion at the moment is misclassification. Yeah. Um, but I suppose if there's a, you know, there could be that discussion amongst the general populace if they're not aware of the inaccuracy issues. Mm. Um, you know, I, I think you could point at the general privacy literature on, on those thing, type of things, also in terms of chilling effects and everything. Um, now, I should say that, like, you know, I'm kind of looking at the easy spectrum of cases here. Um, there's a lot of deployments of motion AI, for instance, at airports uh, for public security, for things like that. So there, I suppose, you know, your human rights or fundamental rights concerns um, skyrocket um, a lot more, especially in light of the fact of the inaccuracies. Um, you know, and that's despite the fact that we have an abundance of regulation um, in this space, uh, but we have nothing, I suppose, indicating that it has to be done well, necessarily. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I mean, apart from the potential liability from a fallout. Yeah, I think it's interesting because I, you know, I recall when we started all saying, watch what you say, you know, post 9-11, watch what you say at the airport, no joking, uh, no flippant remarks and and of course, one of our kids, when he was 14 at San Francisco airport, made a little joke as an aside and said, they think you're kidnapping me. Well, that was it. We almost missed the flight for the Q&A we all had to go through after that. And it was, it really complicates things when you suddenly think, oh, it's not just when I, what I say anymore. It's my facial expressions. I've got to watch how I express myself. And we know a lot of this gets lost in translation. You know, basically that means if you're at an airport, don't be Irish or Australian because we've got a sense of humour no one understands. Um, anyway, look, let's leave it at let's leave it at the one minute to the hour. Liz, would you would you have any parting comments you'd like to share before we wrap up what has been an amazing hour and a half? Yeah, well, what an extraordinary um, discussion uh, and three such different perspectives. To be honest, Pip, I didn't know quite what to expect, but um, there's been so much. Um, food for thought in the three presentations, Bruce, the, uh, the number of people talking in Australia about how to fund space and space exploration is a burgeoning conversation and that sort of the nexus between public and private in that regard, who's responsible for what, how corporations are dictating many of the questions that are arising in, in ways that Pip and Damien have reflected on means this is a very fertile ground and Pip to your credit once again lies absolutely at the heart of the purpose of this seminar series um, and is the final one 2001 I just would very quickly like to say great job Pip as always um, not just in terms of I think the rigour and the content but the really lovely way you facilitate these conversations and make it accessible and uh, interesting and insightful and you know inspiring even for someone like me who's not a lawyer so thank you, Pip, and a &U. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Liz. And look, I think we always wanted to assume our, our audience was a very well-educated, very intelligent, perhaps, field of non-experts. We often do have a lot of experts in the room, I note. Uh, and hopefully you'll all join us next week for some fun 
social scholarship, which is what next Thursday is all about. Um, we will have the Q&A, we'll have lots of um, discussion, we look forward to it. Um, everybody, if you're interested in grad certs in human security law, we're launching one in um, 2022 here at ANU, so check it out. But um, Liz, Damien, Bruce, we're signing off for now. Look forward to seeing as many of you next week as possible. And thank you very much, Liz, and to the Menzies Foundation for an amazing piece of support for something really original for 2021. It's been an absolute privilege and an honor, so thank you.